Should we announce that we're here at the EWE Studios at SST in Weehawken, New Jersey? Weehawken. Weehawken. Sounds like some sort of cowboy term. Interestingly enough, we are not far from where Aaron Burr and Hamilton had their duel. duel right up the road a little bit, where the Hudson River managed to flow freely through this very studio during Superstorm Sandy. In part one, I promised that we would get to what the, the story everyone wants to know. People Magazine, it's on the cover there. How did Smart come to be? A very dear old friend of mine said, you know, to eight people in the world, you're famous. That's cool, that's uh, eight more than me. Oh yeah, I don't think so. I uh, thought you were like up to 12 or 14. Well, you know, we, I got kids, so you know, that's, I got that going for me. Yeah. The story of Smart. Where we left off, I had been working with the folks at Artec and joined the Joiner Rose group. And we talk about SysID. Yeah, I had been using SysID, swept sign, FFT system. Not dual channel. It was really not. The thing about dual channel is people use that term incorrectly. What they mean by dual channel, they're sending a signal and coming back. And subtracting the two, potentially. Or, or, or yes, or doing some trying to figure out how the signal was manipulated and getting the impulse response. The need for SMART was threefold. One was, I didn't believe the people making hardware cared about user interfaces or software. They cared about selling you hardware. Two, all of the equipment like time delay spectrometry based systems and SysID, the underlying principles weren't really intended to help you set up a show. They were trying to make semi-anechoic measurement. They were trying to do things that were more geared towards assembly lines, noise rejection, semi-anechoic measurement meant that you were trying to window to, out the right room. to devalue the influence of the room Reflected in your energy. measurement that's why from a speaker designer standpoint yes. that's a great thing that's right but from a, a person that's trying right. to AQ in front of house it's useless that distinction was lost on everyone I spoke to I remember the whole concept was adjust the window measure each reflection if you sat in a synod commandant to give you the whole it was if you calculate the distance from here to there to the window I never saw anyone actually do that and more importantly I don't think you actually could you know the multiple yeah, reflections it was it was very complicated right. and even if you could do it i'm not sure you wanted to the idea was that i was looking at impulse responses a lot there are two types of impulse response absolute impulse response starts at time zero and then shows you what time the direct sound arrives at your measurement position and then there's you don't know they the, the signal could actually wrap around the starting time is arbitrary and that was the problem with this thwapping technique that david grisinger had published clarify that i'm not sure how many people would actually understand what you mean by wrap around. Okay. It's a hard concept right. for a lot of people get So if you, if you think of an impulse response, it starts at time zero, and then there's this big spike of energy, which represents the direct wave. Everything to the right of the direct wave is reverberation, reflections, you know, the response of the room and the system to the, the, excitement. the excitement. What happens is that you get these discrete reflections, and as sound gets diffracted and bounces around, you start to get a semi-diffuse sound field, and the diffuse field starts to build up and fade away, and at different frequency ranges at different rates. Your view of the world is a block of time, right. usually determined by the amount of memory you and have. And that's in a single states. impulse. The excitement doesn't have to be. At David Grisinger's technique, it was a, a white signal that was enveloped. Right. What I wanted to see was direct to reverberant levels, how much direct sound you have as a function of frequency before the diffuse field starts to build up, which is directly related to intelligibility. The decay rates at different frequencies, which is very much dedicated to tonal balance. The idea of a time delay spectrometry providing you an envelope of that or the energy time curve and not the actual impulse response was frustrating to me. I wanted to see each reflection, uh, their level relationship and their position relative to each other. And that was masked in this technique, fundamentally to the technique. A number of people that I was becoming friendly with really wanted a better measurement tool for production. Acoustic, audio production. Audio production. The, Acoustics crowd never felt they had a good tool for making acoustical measurements. While I was at Artec, a guy named Bob Esser and Nick Edwards came up with the idea of using a three-dimensional drawing in AutoCAD to put a source and receiver in. And I think Bob wrote the first version. I did the 
first 3D drawings and 3D faces. You know, this is AutoCAD 2.01. What we were able to do was image casting where you could find sets of reflections. The ray tracing kind of? Not ray tracing, you throw rays out in every right. direction. Image casting, you use a mirror image. So let's say you have a rectangular room and a source and a receiver inside. You draw a line from the source to the image of the receiver. If you fall within that plane of that surface, that's a valid reflection. We were able to implement that and start looking at reflection structures. And I think we were among the first people doing that with 3D auto Rough timeline on that. 88. So now I wanted to compare what we were generating mathematically on these 3D models with real impulse response. I wanted to measure real impulse responses. At the same time, Bell Labs offered me an opportunity to work on a echo canceler for video conferencing over cable boxes. It was a nice position, I was honored. I spent the better part of a year studying techniques for measuring impulse responses and how to get echo cancelers to converge. Essentially what an echo canceler does is figures out the impulse response between the loudspeaker and a microphone. As you know, half duplex, you shut down one and, yeah. and open the other and do a little gain reduction. Through the curves. Right, and then full duplex, you do echo cancellation. Now it, it doesn't seem like much, but back then it was a hard problem. Now Figure you just got a library that does it. We're gonna use a test signal that would be AT&T logo. An interesting thing happened. I had met Thorny while working with the Joyner Rose Group on the Sky Dome in Toronto. They were doing AIDA. With Pavarotti or? No, no, it was like a huge 1500 person parade with tigers in cages and giant snakes and elephants and camels. And I mean, it was a whole menagerie. It was a crazy big production. And there was a sphinx that opens and the, the people paraded out. And Thorny was the sound designer. We started talking about his challenges and Thorny was Pavarotti system engineer. He was facing the problem of Pavarotti wanting loud monitors. He was hearing them in the mics. He wanted to come up with an echo cancel for the monitor. When you had a stationary mic and a stationary signal and a stationary monitor, you could pull that out if you knew the impulse response. You could invert the curve and echo cancel. That's when we started talking about it. We got together a couple of times. How did you measure the impulse response? We never got around to actually implementing it for Pavarotti. That's how it all started. I went up to Thorny's place in Marin. He lived in Mill Valley. We we spent a couple of days talking about it. We met again in Los Angeles. We ended up on the beach in Malibu, drawing screens in the sand. If you could imagine, the two of us did not look like LA surfer types. No, you look like guys drawing diagrams yeah, in the sand. Yeah, drawing <laughs> flowchart diagrams of calculations and signal paths in the sand. You know, I got into this to meet girls and hang out with cool musicians. And look what happened. And look what happened. I, I, I get to hang out with so, you. So we were telling you, it's very smart. We got to Thorny on the beach. Right. One more trip up to Marin. And at that point, I had already met Don Pearson, co-founder of Ultrasound. Basically, a sound company set up to service the Grateful Dead. So I met Thorny for breakfast at one of my favorite places in Sal Salido, the Lighthouse. And Thorny and I decided to start the SIA software company. We agreed that we both put up some money and um, I remember my hand shaking Sorry. when I wrote the check. And we didn't have a contract, we did it on a handshake. I said, what do you want to own? And he said, let's figure that out down the road. Whatever you say is fair and amazing individual. So that's how it started. And I found a programmer who I had never met before, but was friends of people I was friends with at Bell Labs named Dave Dalton. Dave and I would text each other using AOL chat. It was the first day. It was very, you know, it was, you know there were not a lot of graphics or anything. And I, I would just say, is it done yet? You once told me you wrote out functionally what it was. Yeah, I, I still have those notebooks someplace. They're in storage somewhere. But at that point, SIM was already starting to be a good thing, you know, and, and I was very intrigued and, and had great respect for John and Helen and thought about what they were doing a lot. The problem was they weren't really interested in room acoustics. In their view, this was a sound system setup tool. They sold sound system systems. It makes perfect sense. On the other hand, you have the capability of measuring full impulse responses and finding reflection, pointing out to people where there are acoustical problems and tonal imbalance. I wanted to do that. You know, it's funny because I was pretty distant, but I was watching, I thought it was a major advance in system alignment. From my perspective, theirs was a really hardware-based approach. 
Correct. When I describe Spark, mm -hmm. I always say it's the first native. Everything occurred inside that Pentium. Right. And let me days. wait. And let me just say, dumb luck timing. I thought Smart was going to be hardware. I would get a bunch of DSP cards from the folks at Ariel or someone. They had all these cards, like little 56K cards you could put in a computer. And there was no really good way to get data in and out of a laptop or a, a computer. It was, uh, it was not easy. I wanted to make it practical and I wanted to focus on the user not having to think about scientific stuff. Just look at data that correlated with what they were here. But, you know, you could get your Hewlett Packard stuff together. And you, there were a lot of ways to do something like what, what, what we're talking oh, about. Yeah. But you had to be a real hardware, software integrator right. guy, or you bought a complete solution from Meyer. Or, or, or B and K. Or B and K. But, but the but B and no K, well, it was 50 grand or more, but it didn't do full bandwidth. Right. So you could look, I don't think, I think it was two it options It was for industrial, time. was it? Yeah. It was industrial I, first, yeah. You know. It's funny, if you look at the history of acoustics, and forget the audio side of it for a second, 50s and 60s, acoustics research was largely funded by military. NASA and military. And then in the 70s, car companies really wanted mufflers and engine mounts. They wanted cars to become quiet. You must start getting OSHA. By the 80s, you started to have people worrying about cinema and synthesis, sound related, music related. There was a, a change in, in the air. The tools that were available started getting better and you could start to do things. I still didn't think that a PC at those time could run, you know, real time transfer functions and quick enough impulse responses. Yeah, we're talking 486s. 386s, 286s. Megahertz, you know, yeah, yeah. 16 megahertz. Th these interviews are making me feel old <laughs> repeatedly. Well, I think mean, we got to do some fun things. Talking about this native versus DSP, the DAW world, right. where you had Pro Tools, DSP base, and then you had all the native stuff, the Cubase and the Logic. Don't do anything hardware, do everything native. Processors will catch up. And he was right, ultimately. But you didn't go in there with that decision. You No, I assume that I couldn't do that. You know, on a general purpose right. PC. I needed to run really long FFTs because I wanted to measure impulse responses many seconds long. So when you say long FFT, that's the number of samples. You get half the number of points for N samples. You get N over two. 1024, you get 512 data. The 1024 is the time window. 1024 over your sampling rate. I wanted 128K because I could take these and make impulse responses. It turns out that that's what Sim and BNK and other people were doing when they did low frequencies. They were using very long time windows at low frequencies and very short at high frequencies. That's the only way to get resolution that looks reasonable. Uniform. You can get all this resolution at the high frequencies, but you get, you know, two samples at low frequencies. FFT point, very poor low frequency resolution and excessive high frequency resolution. It, it's hard to do equal resolution, multi-time window, one channel analyzer because the filters that are required to generate different windows show up in your curve. Theoretically could correct for them, but not really. Because you have signal A, your reference signal, and signal C, your measured signal, you're dividing those two. Whether you divide them and look at it in the frequency domain, we call it a transfer function. If you divide them and look at it in the time domain, we call it an impulse response. Either way, the same filters are used in both and you're dividing them, the effect of those filters essentially goes away to a very, very, very high degree. So you're looking at the difference. What's really interesting, this is what correlates with our hearing. The Japanese acoustician Kaoshi Ando, Leo Branick, and a number of other people studied this. Your ear is faster at high frequencies based on the number of wavelengths and time constants. It has to be to have that bandwidth. That's right. And those days, memory was very expensive. So they were memory limited. You could throw tons of processing at it. You just had no place to put the data. The buses weren't particularly fast. So what I discovered, I didn't care how much memory I had because I had hard drives and I had big memory models on the PC. I just didn't have that much computer power. I could do long FFTs for the low frequency part. The transfer function you see in smart or other programs, the multi-time window to equal resolution per octave. We used to call it FPPO, fixed point per octave. 
you can call it equal resolution per octave, whatever the terminology of the day is. That style of multi-window transfer function, which looks like one line that moves in real time, is really six, seven, or eight Frankenstein together measurements right. on the same data. Yeah. It was guys like Don Pearson and Thorny who really wanted that. I really wanted the impulse response. <laughs> I wanted the part that other people didn't care about so much. For me, it was important to build it because I wanted to make Don happy and I wanted to make Thorny happy and I wanted to contribute to setting up sound systems. I thought that was interesting and great, but I really wanted to measure room and room decays. And one of the things when we talk about how to build a small studio is what are your goals? The goals for smart were make sure the system components are all working. Make sure they interact properly. If you have a high, mid, low, three-way system, make sure the crossovers are correct. One task was to make sure that all the system components were working, make sure their relative levels were right and that their time interactions and crossovers were right, the polarity was right. Being an old man, we came from a world where time we knew existed, but there was no way to control. In analog equipment, it was very difficult to control time. And measurement, there was no real way to look. An RTA showed you a response plot, but time was not. Funny thing is that I don't think of an RTA as a response plot as much as I think of it as an energy at a moment plot. It's not the response of something. It's the way it excites the room at a moment. There's no qualitative information available. Why is there a hole there? Is that due to a Polarity inversion is that right. due to a reflection? That's what I'm saying. You could not see any of these things. You might know enough to infer it. There was no way to directly measure that or control it. You know, all these time-based effects and all these things. They were really difficult or impossible. Digital gave us the ability to have control over time. One of my favorite stories is when I came back to New York, I guess this jumps ahead, but I had licensed Smart originally to JBL, and then we sold it to EAW. Yeah, to I liked you. it so much I bought the company. There you go. I was working on uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, the manufacturer of a DSP product, and he said, we've got the box that will solve- Reflection problem. No, not acoustical problem, sound system problem. That's the worst line, as Rob Scoville, once said to a salesman, no piece of hardware or software messages. solves my problem. I solve my problems and I pick the tools with which I use to solve it. This will Sam end Burkow. part two of About Pro Sound Session with Sam Burko. Dave Dole said, I'm going to go deaf listening to the swept sign. It's 20 decibels too hot. He's he clearly to needs to take a break That's to everything. stop Siri from bugging us. We'll pick up from our recordings at SST Studios from right about here where Sam starts giving me a hard time about dropping the primary audio recording halfway through part two. Sorry about that. In part three, our next segment, Sam will finish the story of how Smart was brought to life and figure out how to do it all natively on the PC CPU. There's no shortage of rabbit holes Sam and I can go down. I'll try to keep them for part four. If you like this and want to make sure you don't miss part three with Sam, along with the rest of the exciting educational videos we at About Pro Sound have coming, please hit the subscribe button. Let us know what topics and people you want us to explore in future videos with a note in this video's comment section or drop us an email using the address in the description below. Thanks from all of us for watching and we'll see you in the next video. I love the sound of analog consoles in the morning with DSP driven multi way loudspeakers. What a combination. Sam Burkow, you have recent messages. Please respond to your fucking phone calls. The biggest problem.